second, obedience is pretty important. Yeah, obedience is really important, especially when you're telling your toddler, don't go out by the road. Because they could get squashed like a pancake, right? It's pretty important for your kids to obey you. And in the same respect, it's really, really important for us to obey God. I want to tell you a quick little story uh, that may amuse you a little bit. So I'm about, let's say, four years old. And a uh, good-looking young lad, I would say. Uh, I just kind of threw that in. But uh, so, so we're living in this house, and across the street is some more houses. And behind those houses, there is a big, huge ditch. Now, this ditch was like, to me, you know when you're smaller, everything else is bigger, right? This thing, to me, was like the Grand Canyon. This thing was stinking huge, vast span of just canyon. All right, it was probably like 15 feet across. So my mom and dad told me specifically over and over and over, Brad, there's a lot of things we'll let you get away with. There's, there's things you can do. There's things that you can't do. But one thing you are not to ever even think about doing is crossing that road and going behind those houses down into that ditch because it's treacherous. There's, there's alligators in there, and it's a swamp, and there's quicksand, and if you get your foot caught, you'll sink, and you'll never return ever to humanity again. You will die. And I thought to myself, sounds pretty cool, right? So uh, later on in the ditch, I'm looking up. It had rained the night before. My sister is hovering over the top of this canyon with her friends. They're on their bikes. Is those banana seats with the high, you know, framed uh, back, you know, rest. Pretty awesome with the little frillies that hang from the handlebars. Those were the days. And they're hanging over their bikes. I just totally dated myself. Rough. And we're online. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Edit that. Okay, so, so I'm at the bottom of this ditch. They're like, hey, Brad, you probably ought to take a big mud ball and fling it right in your buddy's face. My best friend, JJ, lived a few houses down. We were homies, four years old, hanging in the hood. It was awesome. So JJ's my best friend. We're hanging out, and they said, throw that mud ball in his face. So I thought, man, I really want to impress these guys. I don't have any friends. I'm boring. I'm lonely. I'm a nerd. I really want to go somewhere in life. So I grabbed the mud ball, and I just flung it as hard as, my, as I could and slapped right in the face. I hit JJ right in the mouth with a big big ball of soupy, nasty mud. So JJ has the foresight to have already packed one of these dudes in his hand. And he replies and returns the favor with, of course, a mud ball, flinging it right towards me, smack right in the face. And I thought, the nerve that he would, he would actually throw a mud ball and hit me in my face. It was on. I mean, it was on, man. Before you knew it, we were flinging mud left and right, and I was getting in the face and in the mouth. And just remember that when it was all said and done, I was covered in mud. My hair had mud in it, my eyes, my teeth, my ears, all the way down to my feet. I had mud all over me. JJ was covered in mud. We were totally covered in mud. And I thought to myself, my mom is going to totally kill me. I crawled up out of the ditch, and there was the neighbors that lived in those houses. They, you know what they said to me? It was amazing. I didn't even expect it. They said, your mom is totally going to kill you. And I thought, it's confirmation. This, I'm going to die. It's official. I'm not going to make it. So, I, I, so it's broad daylight, right? And so I'm tiptoeing across the yard like no one can see me. I'm invisible. So I'm tiptoeing across the yard. And as soon as my toe touches the pavement of the street, my mom comes out like a whirlwind. All right, four foot eleven, mad like she is hacked off seriously. Busts out the full name, Bradley Taylor Helton. I thought, oh my God, oh my God, I'm going to die. Because anytime she used my full name, I knew I was going to get beat. It was going to be awful. I thought this is going to be the worst child abuse case that ever goes down in the history of Missouri. Horrible. I knew I was in for it before I made it across the street. I mean, I, I didn't even reach the other side, and she grabbed hold of me, and she started undressing me in my front yard. Before we made it to the faucet on the wall, she had declothed me fully, other than my Fruit of the Looms, okay? So I'm humiliated. The whole neighborhood now is gathered around. They may have been chanting something crazy like, kill him, kill him, kill him. I, I was so scared for my life. I was naked, other than my Fruit of the Looms. 
She takes the right hand and grabs the hose and cranks on the, the cold water and begins spraying me down from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, just, just douses me in water and starts spraying the mud off. And she said, don't you ever, ever, ever disobey your mama again. And she was spraying me off. I'm humiliated. It's a wet underwear contest. I'm four years old. It's inappropriate. My friends are laughing. I'm humiliated, humiliated. And I thought to myself, self, I don't think I'm ever going to do that again. I was a brilliant child. I mean, I learned fast. I, I picked things up. I was quick, you know. I never played in that ditch again because she made an interesting psychological impact on me that, that, that has changed me, altered me, impacted me for all of time. I will never be the same again, ever again, because of what that woman did to me on my lawn that day. And I will never go back to that ditch as long as I live. But here's the important thing to remember, folks. You're like, what on earth does this have to do with God's word? It's about obedience. I learned very quick in life that obedience is really, really, really important. And today we're going to learn about a guy who was known for his disobedience. And look what God does with him. Turn to Jonah this morning. I have to say, that is honestly our children's favorite story they've heard since they could even, like, speak. And Brad has told that story over and over. And when their friends come over, they say, Dad, tell our friends the story about you in the ditch. And so the story has been exploded and exploited. It gets better, definitely. And your poor mom, his mom is actually the one in our coffee shop, the sweetest woman. And she honestly— And they're walking her out in handcuffs right now. She wouldn't beat anybody, and I bet you didn't get one spank in your entire life. You needed two. one or two, but Three. you didn't get them. But you did get sprayed off in your fruit of looms. I did. Go with me to Jonah chapter 1. Today we're going to look at a guy who, although he was a prophet of God, God spoke to him. He was doing the will of God in his life. He is known for his disobedience. And today, you've probably, whether you've been to church your whole life or whether today is the first day you've ever donned the doors, I bet you've heard of a guy who landed in the belly of a well. Now, we don't know if it was really a well, and there's actually a theater right now, Sight and Sound Theater in Branson, that is showing this very story. Now, we've been there. We haven't seen Jonah, but let's it go is. Let's right now. Let's, let's all run out the doors. It's phenomenal. We've been there. We've seen a couple of the others. But this story is known around the world, and unfortunately, Jonah was known for his disobedience. Let's read. The Lord gave this message to Jonah. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Where is he supposed to go? Nineveh. Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it, because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up, and he went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa, where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought, that's a hard word to say. It sounds I know like you're laughing. you have a speech impediment, I know. Tarshish. How do you say it without Tarshish. a speech impediment? Just say it with a straight face and work right past it. Tarshish. Tarshish. Just slow it down. He bought a ticket. He went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing. We won't, we'll just skip that word. He was going to sail far away. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. We're going to stop right there because I'm not going to read all five chapters. I'm going to tell you what happens from here on out. Jonah is on this ship. Now, this is a double-decker, okay? It's kind of like in today's, it would be like a houseboat, okay? So you can go downstairs in this boat. Jonah goes on. He knows he's running from God. He goes down into the bottom of the boat, and he does what everybody does when you're stressed out, right? We get a cup, of, like a big deal of ice cream. We eat the whole thing, and then we go to sleep. That cures everything, right? Right? Wrong, but that's probably what he did. I don't know if they had ice cream or not, but whatever they had, like figs or something. Figs. Figs. He yeah. probably had some figs. Fig he goes to sleep. And as he's sleeping, all of a sudden, this ginormous storm, which God has brought, begins to just take this boat and just like toss it like a rag doll. I don't know if you've ever been on the lake when there was a storm. Has anybody ever been out on the lake when there's a storm? Does that not just about freak you out? I mean, yes, there's still hands. Like, yes, I was totally, completely freaked out. Because you're thinking, I'm going to die right here. Well, that was the captain and all the sailors. They were thinking, we are going to die. They saw, they served false gods and idols is who they worshipped. They began to just cry out to any god, like any god in the universe, help us. 
And all of a sudden, they're looking around, and they're wondering, like, where is that guy that boarded the ship with us? Who, who knows where he's at? And so they go to find him, and the captain goes down into the bottom of this boat, and where does he find Jonah? But curled up like a little baby, just sleeping. He's not at all bothered by the storm. And so the captain is like shaking him like, wake up, dude, what is wrong with you? We're all going to die. Do you not see the storm? Something horrible has happened. One of us has committed this great sin. And Jonah like wipes his eyes because he knows, okay, he already knows. And he's like, come on, get up. Do you know what's going on? Who are you? And I love that question. He says, who are you? It's like that moment where you realize somebody is not who you thought they were. He said, who are you? And Jonah says, I'm a Hebrew, which I'm an Israelite, basically. He said, and I'm running from God. And they're like, oh, what? Why did you choose our boat? Like, why in the world? We didn't do anything wrong. We haven't done nothing. We don't even know who your God is. And here you are stinking on our boat, and we're all going to die because of you. This is fabulous. And so Jonah's like, Whoa. so he comes up, up upstairs, up the ramp, whatever you climb to get on top. And man, I mean, the boat is still. It's falling apart. They are sitting there just trying all they can do to keep it afloat. And he says, what are we going to do? Pray to your God that he'll have mercy on us. And Jonah's thinking to himself, God is not going to listen to me because I'm running from him. And so he said, what are we going to do? And he said, throw me over. And I can just imagine, right? Jonah is already just like, I know what it's going to take. Like, there's no hope praying. I know I'm in direct disobedience. I know the wedgie's coming. I know the discipline's going to happen. Just throw me over. And so they're like, no, no, no. We don't want to do that. We don't want to take your life. We don't want to murder you. And so they begin to cry out, and they throw everything off, everything except for the people. And it doesn't help. Man, the wind is still. It's just coming. And they finally take Jonah. They pick him up, and they hurl him in to the ocean immediately when he clears the side of the boat, the storm completely stops. Now, I don't know about you, but that would totally and completely freak me out probably more than the storm. Because a storm just doesn't like fly in, you're about to die, and all of a sudden the sun is shining, and it's the most beautiful day you've ever seen in your life. That's what happened. All of these sailors are like, (gasps) and I want to read it to you because only God's word can say it the way it happened. In verse 16, it says this, the sailors were awestruck by God's great power. And they offered him a sacrifice and they vowed to serve him. At that moment, they had not believed in God until this moment. And God showed him, all of these guys, how real he really was. When that storm came to a complete stop, they immediately began to say, God, forgive us. You are the one and true God. And they vowed from that moment to serve him. But Jonah, on the other hand, remember, he's about to be disciplined. How many believe your kids, there should be consequences for disobedience? The discipline was going to happen. And so as he was thrown off the edge, God provided a ginormous fish. Now we believe it's a whale only because that is like the largest one that we see today. But he was swallowed whole by this whale or this fish. And so I want you to just imagine just for a moment, I don't know if you've ever done an autopsy um, on one or not, where you can just literally cut them open and see their digestive system. But imagine that Jonah goes into this belly of the well, and immediately what begins to happen in the body, once something comes into the stomach, the process of digestion begins. So the body begins to break it down. So this is not a comfortable place to be. We're talking about places today, okay? Okay. This was not a comfortable place. This was not like the Ritz. He wasn't on vacation. He wasn't going on a cruise. He's now in the belly of a whale, all because he chose to disobey. And so he does the first thing that any smart man knows to do, and that is he begins to pray. Because he realizes, my life is now in the hands of an angry God. There was a sermon years and years ago in the 1800s, and that was the name of it sinners in the hands of an angry God. Man, that was Jonah. And so as he's in there and he's praying, he begins to cry out and to repent and to tell God, if you'll just give me a second chance, I will go back and I'll do what you told me to do the first time. Imagine with me had he just obeyed this whole nasty scenario of the ship and of the storm and being in the digestive system of a whale wouldn't have had to happen, right? So we're going to look for just a minute. We're just going to unpack this for a second and see what it was that Jonah was really thinking, okay? 
We told you earlier, Jonah was a prophet. A prophet was a guy who heard from God, God spoke to him, and he would then go into the cities and he would literally declare whatever God was saying. Okay, so this is not unusual. This was not like all of a sudden Jonah hears something and he's wondering who's speaking to him. He knew it was God. He had heard God's voice many times before. He was known as being a man of God, a prophet of God. But here was the deal. This time he didn't want to obey. Somebody asks you to do something and you're like, I know, I don't want to do that. You know, your kids look at you and go, why? I don't want to do that. Well, that was kind of Jonah, but he had a pretty good reason, okay? He doesn't even argue with God. He just gets up. And if you can go to my map, I want to show you something here. Jonah is like on his knees praying, okay? So just imagine with me. He just hears God and God says, go to where? What, are y'all asleep? Come on, help me out. Nineveh. Go to Nineveh, right? And Jonah does this. He gets up. Nineveh is this way. And he goes all the way over here. Where does he go? The direct opposite way God has asked him to go. And let me tell you why. Because he hated the people of Nineveh. God was telling him to go and declare that God's wrath was going to be poured out on them if they did not change their ways and ask God to forgive them. And Jonah made a decision in his own mind. They don't deserve God's love. Why do they not deserve God's love? Because they are my enemies. They have killed our people. They are the number one battle right now. They're the number one army in the territory. There was 120,000 people in Nineveh. It took three days to walk around that city. It was known to be a very powerful force. And they were taking over everybody. The Assyrians were who they were. They were taking over everybody. And Jonah thought, I don't want to share God's love with them. I don't, that's my enemies. I don't want to do that. So he makes a decision clearly after hearing God's voice to completely and totally disobey. However, I doubt if he will ever, ever do that again. And I think today, in the same way, when you can directly disobey God, he will make you suffer the consequences. He will put you in a place that you don't want to be. Remember, this is a guy who clearly, clearly heard from God on a daily basis. So he knew exactly what God was asking him to do. So he buys this cruise ticket, basically, to Tarshish. And he finds himself in the hole in the bottom of the boat, and the storm's raging like crazy. And, and, and so they begin gambling, like they're casting lots upon the deck. These sailors are like, we're all going to die. We don't understand why. It's got to be somebody on this boat. This is not normal. This is the wrath of a god of some sort. So let's find out what, let's get to the bottom of this. So they start casting lots, and the lots land on Jonah. And so he's downstairs sleeping. They go wake him up, and they're like, dude, what on earth? Who are you? Where are you from? What's your ethnicity? I mean, what is your story? Why are you here? It's my fault. I'm sorry. I blew it. God told me to do something. I didn't do it. And he goes, Whoa. and the scripture says, why did you do that? Right. I mean, it's hilarious when you think about it. The, the captain says, why? I mean, he doesn't even, he doesn't even serve God. Right. He doesn't, this, this captain doesn't have a relationship with God, but he's thinking, okay, like, you, you, you walk with this God every day. I don't know who he is, but you obviously believe that he's powerful, and you're, you chose to not obey. Why did you do that? So long story short, they throw him into the ocean, and guess what happens? This huge whale of some sort swallows him. He's in the digestive juices for days. It's pitch black. It stinks. It's nasty. He's starving. He may be even just kind of just, just treading water. It's not really water, but it's stuff. Treading in the blackness of this whale's belly. It's nasty. And so three days later, what happens? I'll give you a visual illustration. He's in the belly, and then the whale starts to get some indigestive things happening. He goes, blah, 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 blah. throws him and spits him up and vomits him up onto the shore. And he gets up. You can imagine with the mucus and with, with the digestive juices and the acids, and he gets up and he's, what was that? I totally want a refund on that cruise ticket. That was, I just put all over the place. That's crazy. So you know what he does, though? Scripture says, where does he go? Show me the map. Survey says, where's he going? Nineveh. <sighs> it's 
starts going to Nineveh, right? He doesn't say anything. He just gets up. He just starts marching to Nineveh because he knows. I mean, come on, think about it. God has spoken to you clearly. You've been in the belly of a whale for three days. What are you going to do? You're going to argue with God? You say, God, come on. I mean, no, you're going to start hightailing it to Nineveh. Remember, though, that he hated these people with everything inside of him. He hated them. Now, there's two sides to every story. We have to understand he had to have a he had to have had a good reason to have hated these people so much. We can only assume that perhaps this army had maybe bombarded some villages and killed his family. You know, you don't you, we have no idea what he endured to have such a hate for these people. Nonetheless, he did not want to go to Nineveh, but what did he do? He went because he knew he had no other choice. So he goes to Nineveh and for days he's walking through the streets He's preaching God's forgiveness, and he's like, God wants to save you. In 40 days, you all are going to die. If you don't repent and turn from your sins, you're all going down. He's going to destroy all of you. Please, 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 no, don't repent, but God wants you to, so take it or leave it. He's not really happy about delivering this message, but he does it. Okay, so when he's done doing the duty of delivering that message of grace and forgiveness to these people that he hates— Guess what happens? He climbs up the mountaintop, and he sits on top of the mountain, and he's like, yes. He's watching intently. He's watching down the mountainside, and he's just waiting for God to judge them. He's looking up. He's looking down. He's looking up. He's looking down. Nothing's happening. What he doesn't realize is that while he's on the mountaintop, what has happened is the king has climbed down off of his throne, and he has taken his royal robes off, and he has buried himself in sackcloth and ashes. So he's, he's, he's basically thrown out to the whole community, these thousands of people, 120,000 people. Hey, listen, this God is bigger than we are. He's going to destroy this place. We need to turn from our sins. We need to repent. We need to call upon God and ask him to forgive us, and we need to get saved. He didn't know that was happening, and he's sitting here on the mountaintop just waiting for God to destroy these people. He's like, come on, God, you know, send, send some, some hail, send some fire and brimstone, just like the old days. It was awesome, man. Like, like you totally took out Sodom and Gomorrah. Just, I'm, just wait, man, send down those, shoom, those missiles, those, those fireballs, send them down. I'm waiting. Maybe do a flood. What are we going to do, God? Come on, you got all sorts of stuff in your little arsenal of, of destroying villages and stuff, right? What are you going to do now? And he's waiting, and nothing's happening. And then he notices it's getting really, really, really hot. He's like, my land's whew, hot in here. Man, it's getting a little stuffy. He's in the desert, right? The sun is beating down on him. Now he's getting a little thirsty. Now he thinks he's going to die because he's a big sissy. So God raises up this plant behind him, and it starts growing up over the top of Jonah's head. And then it spreads out and, and grows out these big, huge leaves that produces a very pleasant shade. And Jonah says, in the word, it says that Jonah was very, very grateful for the fact that God had produced that shade for him. So now he's cool. So he's like, all right, back to business. What are you going to do, God? He's having a good time just messing with Jonah because Jonah is such an idiot, okay? So, he's, he, so God raises up this worm that begins eating away at the plant. And he's noticing, hey, it's getting a little hot again. He, know, he looks up and there's some, some beams of light coming through holes of the leaves of the plant because this worm is like going to town on this plant and he gobbles the whole thing up until it withers and falls over and now he has more shade. And God's like, <laughs> ah, that's pretty good. That's good stuff, right? That's good. And Jonah is like, hey, did you bring me out here in the desert to die? Does it sound familiar? Children of Israel sitting up on the mountaintop in the desert looking down waiting for God's judgment to fall on these people and he is burning up and God's laughing and he's like why won't you just destroy these people and what's crazy about the story when you read it is that's the very end of the story you're thinking where's the happy ending no he was an idiot he never actually, he never actually obeyed God with gladness of heart and hoping, you know, wanted to do a great thing for God because he was known all over the land for being this awesome prophet that loved God, that heard from God, that delivered these messages to his people and, and just, he was a hero of the faith. And as history goes on, you know, here we are thousands of years later 
And we don't know Jonah as being the awesome prophet of God. We know him for his disobedience. Think about the impact. Think about the severity that disobedience has on our lives. Think about it. That's what happened to Jonah. My question for you today is, is that going to be you? Are you going to be known for your obedience to God or for your disobedience? How does this apply to us? How is it that God sometimes will take us to some pretty rough places? Well, the first thing that we have to see from this story is that in order to obey God's voice, you have to first be able to hear God's voice. Now, God will speak to people who have never even, like, professed Him, never had a relationship with Him, and that's the first time that you may feel that drawing, like, there's a sick something in my stomach, like, I, I know there's a void in my life, and that's God trying to tell you, you're missing me. That's what's missing in your life. You're in a miserable place because you don't have me in your life. And so Jonah, he knew God. He had already committed to God. He was serving God. And then comes along those of us who have made that decision. We've asked Christ to come into our life. We've been forgiven. And now God will speak to us all the time. And maybe it's not audible. Maybe it's something in your mind. Maybe it's something that you read in the Word of God. I remember when I was honestly 16 years old when I first gave my life sincerely to Christ. I mean, I was all out. It's all you, God. I'll give up everything else. And God told me to stop listening to anything but Christian music. And I remember when he spoke that to me, I was down praying in an altar in a church. And I thought, that's stupid. Like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. But I kept griping and complaining that I was kind of riding a roller coaster in life. I kind of felt like I would do good and I was this awesome person in church. But then I'd go back out and I would have a horrible attitude. And I would hang out with the wrong people. And so God spoke this to my life. And so I got up at that moment and I made a decision to walk out of that church and to obey God that day. And so for the next year, God told me one year, I don't even know if I told you how long. He told me one year, don't listen to anything but Christian music. It'll change your life. And so I went out to my car and I took the CDs out that weren't Christian and I threw them in the trash. And then I changed my radio stations and I reprogrammed them to be Christian stations only. And for the next year of my life, I did not listen to anything but Christian music. Now, when you do that, you know, your brain is a computer, okay? And so what God was doing in my life was he was reprogramming my computer. He was getting rid of the trash that I had filled my mind with because music will fill your head. And so God speaks to each of us differently. That was a really big deal in my life. And I had that chance to either obey or like Jonah, disobey. And I knew what it was like to disobey. I'd done that before. I'd been in that place of disobedience. And I'm telling you, that changed my life all because I chose to obey. Okay, but the second thing we have to know is that you're going to have to surrender before you can obey. When I was at that altar, I had to say, God, I want your will for my life. I believe that you created me with a purpose. I believe that I'm not just here to suck up oxygen. I believe that I have a bigger purpose in this life, and I don't know what it is. You created me. I didn't create myself. The Bible says you formed me in my mom's womb. I want your perfect will for my life. I surrender my will into your hands, and I choose today, God, to be obedient. Jonah, however, when he chose disobedience and he chose to run from God, here's what will happen. You can run from God, but you can't hide from God. And a lot of times we try to hide from God. A lot of times we try to run the opposite direction. We get around all the people who don't make us feel bad, right? If we're doing the wrong things, and I, I can vouch for this, when I was living my life and not doing the right things, who do you think were the people I did not want to be around? all the godly people doing the right things. I'm like, I am not going to church. I don't want to be around my mom and dad. They make me feel bad. They convict me. They make me feel guilty. Well, it wasn't anything they were saying. It was because the presence of God were all over those people. And so you can run as far as way. Man, you can go into the darkest pit. You can go anywhere you want trying to hide from God. And God says, I love you so much. I'm going to grab a hold of you. I'm going to throw you into a nasty, miserable place until you wake up. And I'm telling you, I, I heard a story just this week, and I listened to it, about a girl who grew up a preacher's daughter. And this girl, Janie was her name, she grew up a preacher's daughter, and her mom and dad at the age of 10, they had spent all their time helping other people. They'd spent all their time 
ministering to people and they had let their marriage fall completely apart. And so at the age of 10, her mom and dad separated and they got a divorce. And Janie began to hate God. She began to not understand why my whole life, my mom and dad sacrificed everything to tell people about Jesus and their own marriage fell apart. And so Janie says in her story that she began at that time to just run from God. Well, it wasn't very long down the road. A few months later, her mom and dad reconciled and they got remarried. And God began to bring healing to that marriage. But Janie was so hurt by what had happened. And so Janie began to go out and live the party life. And at the age of 15, Janie was raped. And because she was so frustrated with her life, she'd begin to stress eat. And she, at 15, weighed over 200 pounds. And so she felt awful about herself. Now she's been raped. So she did the only thing she knew what to do, and that is she ran right out to the party scene. And she started filling her life with people and alcohol and people who would make her feel good. And one day someone came up to her and gave her a hit of cocaine. And she said from the moment she took that first hit of cocaine, she was addicted. And the reason was all of a sudden it made her forget about everything that was real in her life. And so this wasn't something that she could just have one time and never do again. It became a habit that she had to have every single day. And soon enough, a hit of cocaine wasn't enough, and she started shooting up other things. And all of a sudden, she said, I had a habit that was a three to $400 a day habit because I couldn't handle the reality of life because I was running from God. Because I felt like everything in my life was God's fault and I was running as far away from him as I possibly could. And in the moment, I was destroying my own life. This beautiful girl in her 20s had destroyed her life. So at the time she was like 21 years old, there were 17, um, whatever for her arrest. What do you call it? A warrant. There's never been one on me. There were 17 warrants out for her arrest in her early 20s. And she began to say that I was running from the law now. I was running from God. And she said, finally, it all caught up to me. And she stood before a judge and they sentenced her to 18 months in prison. And so she goes in and she serves that. And they wanted to give her a chance. She's a young woman. They gave her a second chance. They said, you're on probation for the next two years. She went directly out of that courtroom. After she had been released, she went right back out again to the drug scene and to, to organize crime. And as she did that, she again landed herself in front of a judge. And this time, she was sentenced to 40 years in prison. And she said as she walked out of that courtroom that day, she looked up, and she was outside, and she looked up to the sky, and she thought, God, what have I done with my life? God, you gave me a life, and I knew you, Jesus. I prayed to you. I lived for you as a child. And then because I got hurt, because of things that happened that my mom and dad we're dealing with. I ran from you and now I've destroyed my life. When it comes time for me to get married, I'm going to be in prison. When it comes time for me to have kids, I'm going to be in prison. And when I come out, I'm going to be too old to do all of those things. And so she said she fell down right there, cuffed and all. She fell on the ground, tears running down her face. And she said, God, if you can still use me, if you can still do anything with my life and the mess I've made of it, God, I surrender to you. I give you my life today. I'll obey you in anything you ask me to do, God. And they stood her up and they took her into the prison. And she said she served for a couple of years there when she got a letter one day from her mom. And the judge that had sentenced her to 40 years had now retired and someone else was there. And her mom said, we have a new court date. They're going to rehear your trial. They're going to go back and they're going to let you come in again. And this time when she walked into the judge, the judge looked at her and she said, young lady, I'm going to give you one last chance to get out of this room and to go make something of your life. And she said, I'd spent the last two years reading my Bible and praying every day in that prison cell. And she said, I walked out of that courtroom and I vowed I will make something of my life for you, Jesus. And to this day, she speaks all over the country sharing her message of what God did in her life because he completely, totally turned her around, gave her a husband, gave her children, gave her a ministry. Because you can run from God, but you can't hide from God. God will put you in a place of misery. And that was all brought on her because of disobedience, because she wasn't willing to do what God was telling her to do as a young child, as a young teenager. But God loved her so much. And we can look at that story and we can say, you know what, I know people just like that. Or maybe that's you. 
Maybe you're the one running from God. Maybe you're the one who feels hopeless today. But the amazing thing is, God is a God of second chances. God gave Jonah a second chance. God gave Janie a second chance. God gave me a second chance. And he'll give you a second chance today. What God is calling all of us to is a life of obedience. If we will surrender to him and say, God, whatever you ask me to do, I'm going to obey you. But what's most important is what is our responsibility? What has he called us to do? Be obedient. Be obedient. Be obedient. Obedient to his word each and every day. Obedient to God's house. Obedient to godly relationships. Obedient to serving in his kingdom. Obedient to praying over your wives, men. Thank you. Obedient to spending adequate time with your children or raising up God-fearing kids. Obedient to, to, to giving God your mind and your heart. Obedient to giving Him your time. Obedient in every area of your life. Obedience. It's what He's called us to. This life is not about us. It's about Him. It's not about the house that I can build or the car that I can drive. And those things are okay. But it's about obedience. I'm a servant of God. My spiritual name is Bradley, bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I exist to glorify and to honor and to please my Father in heaven. I am about my Father's business. I am not about your business. I am not about my business. I am about my Father's business. And it just so happens that my father's business is to love him with all of my heart and love everybody the same. You are called to be obedient. You are called to be a servant of God. Are you ready to be obedient this morning? In the very beginning of our church plant, things weren't going quite well. We were broke. We were in the middle of Nowhereville, Oklahoma with no money in a trailer in the middle of a field wanting to plant a mega church. And things were not going quite well for us. I don't know why, but they weren't going well. And God spoke to my heart, just like he did Jonah, and he said, you made a promise to your church before you went to Bible college that you were going to fulfill that promise financially. We were having a building program, and I made a dedication to give $1,000 to this building project. Misty had done something very, very similar in her situation with her church when they were building a new gym. And both of us had not fulfilled our end of the promise towards those building programs. And God spoke to both of us and said, look, if you want me to open up the windows of heaven on your life and this ministry, you want me to bless it and you want it to grow and see people come to Christ, you're going to have to first be obedient to what you promised me you would do. Because the word says it's better to not make a vow or a promise to God at all than to make one and not to fulfill it. You might as well tie stones around your feet and jump off a cliff into the water. That's what the Word says. And so the Lord dealt with us. And I'm telling you, we were broke. We were broke. I had to sell my guitars. My guitars. My amps. All my music gear so that we could buy groceries. It was bad. And, 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 and I still had $500 that I had to come up with to fulfill my end of the bargain to God. I said, God, are you nuts? Do you, where am I gonna find 500 bucks? You want me to deal drugs? You want me to rob a bank? What do you want me to do? Show me the way. What do you want me to do? Well, we saved our money. We scraped it together over those next few months and the Lord provided that $500 that we needed. It was, it was tough, but he supplied that need and we gave that money. And I'm telling you, I, I, as I was putting that envelope into the mailbox, I was like, $500 and I slammed the door to the mailbox and I thought good riddance get out of here I don't I, I, I was just like Jonah I was like no oh, I hate this but I did it I did not like the word says which it means to give with a joyful heart I didn't do that at all but I gave it and you know what God ended up blessing it there was a shift in our ministry and things begin to change in our family things begin to change in our finances things begin to change in our lives the ministry the ministry began to grow because of obedience 
question for you today. What is God asking you to do? If you guys will go ahead and stand up with me this morning, we're going to receive the tithes and offerings. And we have made it really easy. If you've forgotten your checkbook this morning, you got your smartphones, I know you do, you can text the number 918-223-8090. Easy way of giving comes right out of your account. And you can have that every month or just a one-time deal, but it's super simple.